The scripture this morning is from Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, and that's pages 806 and 807 in the Pew Bible. The kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No. There will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So on that happy note, <laughs> for those of you who follow me on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, yes, I'm in all three places at once, um, you know that this is not my favorite parable. And I'm preaching it because it's in the lectionary, which is the set of Christian texts. So basically, around the world somewhere, a lot of people are preaching on this text and probably grumbling as much as I am. <laughs> on the blog, The Good Preacher, by Reverend Dr. Anna Carter Florence, which I think is a, a very presumptuous blog to call yourself The Good Preacher, but I've heard her preach, and she is. She says this about this parable. The story of the wise and foolish bridesmaids is not a text for the faint-hearted. It's scary and irrevocable, as stories about the end of the world have a tendency to be. It has terrible characters, those smarmy bridesmaids, and a disturbing plot development, Jesus as the gatekeeping troll. Worst of all, it has a history of atrocious and abusive interpretation and all of the collateral damage that goes with that. So joy, let's dive into the text. <laughs> You see, I normally like parables and I love preaching on them, but this one is daunting. Um, I think after hearing it read, you probably feel a little bit the same. At first glance, it seems that this parable is telling us that the kingdom of God might be selfish, unhelpful, stingy, bratty, greedy, anti-community. And it also seems to go against our MBCC value of wherever you are, you are welcome here. In contrast to the other parables that describe the kingdom of God as a priceless pearl, as a lost coin, as a lost son, as a lost sheep, so valuable Jesus will go to get it, this one seems to say the opposite. It also seems to be in direct contrast to the feeding of the 5,000 in the Gospel of John that maybe should be renamed in honor of this parable, the prepared little boy. Instead of the boy sharing what he had, the boy is recast as one who hoards his fish and his bread and gloats over his bounty. Neener, neener. <laughs> but that's not what happens in that story. Jesus encourages abundant thinking, sacrificial sharing. So what is up with this parable? This is probably a good time to remind you in general to keep three things in tension as you read through parables. Number one, we should never take everything from all the parables. So not one parable you should look at all the different pieces of it because it's metaphorical. Number two, one parable doesn't tell us everything about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, whichever gospel you're in. And number three, we need to be reminded that there's more than one parable. And when I read some of the parables like this one of doom and gloom, I'm glad that there are other pictures of the kingdom of God, aren't you? And we must remember that we are in the gospel of Matthew. No other gospel comes close to dealing out bad consequences with fiery endings. He, Matthew, is really preoccupied with the end times. 
But we can find some good news in this series of parables that this one is in the midst. Remembering that this is all about God and God's judgment, not ours. And that God's judgment is actually not mysterious. That God cares about the things that Jesus cares about. The virtues that Jesus embodies, generosity, grace, love, sacrificial care, obedience, perseverance, compassion, the list can go on. Note also that this book, the book of Matthew, was written after the destruction of Jerusalem. So after the destruction of Jerusalem, there were a lot of sects of Judaism that were literally closing their doors to the Jesus community. So what's up with this parable? You have 10 women, or literally the word is virgins, half wise and half foolish, and really the only difference is the amount of oil they brought with them. Or we can use the metaphor of gas in their cars, or batteries in their flashlights. That's the only difference in being let into the party and being kept out? I wanna do that Saturday Night Live thing, really? That's what gets you in or gets you out? Couldn't they share? Couldn't they just be a little let in a little late? I mean, we all make mistakes, right? I know I do. But even though this seems to be about the end times, I actually don't think it is. And notice that there's no, there's the ones who get in don't have any special information. They didn't know when the, the bridegroom was gonna come, did they? None of them did, they all fall asleep. I don't see any heroes really in this story. So let's talk about the oil. Let's talk about their flasks. What does the oil represent? The consensus in my studies is it represents either deeds of love and mercy, basically sort of discipleship, discipleship of God and of one another, the Christian faith preparation um, that Jackson talked about, that those hours you put in to become who you are as a Christian. Some say the Holy Spirit, some say hope, but whatever it is, it's the right stuff because they get in. Whatever it means is clear. You can't light the procession without it, and you can let it run out, and you can't borrow it from others, and it seems very necessary. It seems to me that there's more beauty in sharing and generosity. I hope I'm not alone in that. But there are some things that we learn in life that can't be shared. There are times when you can't rescue those with whom you have community and fellowship. We learn this lesson when we are flying, don't we? So when you're, when the, the ground crew, I like to fly in Southwest because I think they're very funny. They're, um, you know, the, the attendants are very funny, the flight attendants. And um, oftentimes at the beginning of it, they talk about the emergency exits and the things to put on. And if the cabin loses pressure, we all know that whose mask do we put on first? Our own. I remember as a kid thinking that was really weird. I was like, mom, come on, <laughs> hook me up first, right, mom? You know. But no, we learn you're not any good as an adult with your kids if you're passed out because you don't have air. When I, um, when I was in college, I worked at a camp that was on a lake, Lake Sammamish up in Seattle, and I actually learned about lifeguarding. It was terrible because I am not a great swimmer, and we had to do these just terrible daunting swimmings in the lake with, you know, the, you couldn't even see the bottom, and I was very, very scared. But one of the things we learned when you rescue someone is, if you're rescuing someone in water and they start grabbing onto you and holding you, what do you do? You push them away. Yeah. And so the whole rest of the summer we were joking like, push them away, push them away, because it seems so heartless. I mean, someone's drowning and you're pushing them away because the truth is that if they're holding onto you so tightly that you're both gonna go down together, you can't help anyone, can you? Kids learn this at a certain point, hopefully, that you can borrow someone's homework and get by on that one assignment, but you can't borrow the hours they put into studying for that test. There are some kinds of preparation and things we can only do for ourselves. There are some reserves that nobody else can build up for us. You can't borrow someone else's peace of mind or their passion for God or their knowledge of scripture. You can't say to your friend, you have such a great marriage, can I borrow that? <laughs> it doesn't work like that. You have to find it for yourself. You have to figure out what fills you up spiritually and make sure you have some of that to carry with you every single minute of the day because that's how often you'll need it. So this is a personal kind of oil. You have to work for it. 
Our parents, friends, coaches, teachers, and yes, even pastors cannot give it to us. We must get it for ourselves. And then we think about fables, all those stories we tell about the kingdom of God. This story is in the midst of all of those crazy end time stories. And for those of you who were in my Revelation class at ADG, you know that oftentimes Christians make way too much out of uh, Revelation and scary of the end times. But I don't think that's really what this parable is talking about necessarily. Because note what I said before, the wise women don't have any special knowledge that gets us there. And notice that all of the action takes place on this side of the door. I mean, it's weird to us that they wait for the bridegroom because nowadays we just wait for him to text us, wouldn't we? <laughs> I'm gonna be late. Okay, guess I'll go get some more oil. <laughs> we live, though, as if we have all the time in the world. And I think that's what this fable, this story, this parable is reminding us, that we don't have all the time in the world. We don't know when the time is gonna come. Despite many cultural references to eternity, we have finite lives here on earth. And we're told to keep those oil reserves up because you never know when you might lead it to light the way. And then we have this festivity. This is a wedding, and as you know, if you've ever planned a wedding, weddings are wonderful and glorious and difficult and filled with tension and family conflict, right? Weddings are a myriad of wonderful things. But the great thing about weddings is that there's this invitation to party with this couple, this anticipation, this excitement, this joy, this hope, this urgency, this end of a courtship and beginning of a life together. One of the consistent themes in the Gospels is that God is both here and not here at the same time, that time is a little bit different in this kingdom. The kingdom of God is both being worked out now, but also will meet its completion in a later time. So we, as the people of God, meet together and we wait and we wonder, but hopefully we do it with those oil reserves. We do it as anticipating the party. We do it as members of a wedding party that has yet to come. The question I have for you is, how are you waiting? Are you waiting with all of your reserves depleted and your oil running out? Are you waiting, hoping that you can do good things today, not just in the future? Are you living in the past? Or are you anticipating that glorious future that happens with every waking moment now? Or are you waiting to deal with a bad relationship or to take care of your neighbor or to tell someone you love them or to care for yourself? Well, next week I'll take a break. Next week I'll, I'll have spend some quality time with my spouse after my kids are out of the house. Are you waiting? What are you waiting for? What dreams are you waiting to pursue? What risks are you not taking now? God is in all those unspoken wishes and prayers and dreams and hopes. That is what's so powerful about the kingdom of God being described as a festivity like a wedding. God, like a groom, pursues us. We are caught up in this sweeping fable, this sweeping epic love story. And we don't put off doing anything so that we miss out when the door is opened. We should be challenged to live lives marked by active faith. We rely on this church community because there are some parables that tell us what community gives to us. We've had a theme um, this, this fall, uh, blessed to be a blessing. I said I wasn't gonna say blessing in the sermon, but I guess I was wrong. Um, blessed to be a blessing. And sometimes the stories we tell each other from the Bible and of each other are ways in which this community blesses us. But this isn't one of those parables. This is a parable about what you do to bless the community, about what reserves you have to light the way into the wedding party. We rely on a church community to help our oil reserves. We rely on our most helpful traditions, the holy fellowship that includes the forgiveness of one another's sins, our study of scripture, our practice of baptizing children and adults into a new identity in Christ, our sharing of the communion meal once a month to recognize God's beautiful, abundant sustenance. These activities are not robotic. They're not time fillers. They're not just rituals. They serve to mark and sustain us, that we, to remind us that we are ever present with God and we are ever present with one another. And that in those moments, we bring our best selves to the table. 
which is why MBCC offers so many wonderful programs. Jackson highlighted a few, and you all know them because we talked about them at the beginning of church. There's amazing things here and opportunities for you to fill up your oil flask. And I love that this is about fables and flasks and festivities, about being ready when that time comes, when the water breaks, when the opportunity comes, when the diagnosis is given, when you get that new job, when you lose a job, when you retire, when you begin a career, when the starter pistol goes off, when the buzzer sounds, when the coach yells, go, when the orchestra starts, when the lights come up, when the question is asked, when the teacher says, you may start that test now, when the door is opened and the party begins, are you ready? And what do you bring with you? So maybe it's not how much oil you have or even where you're located, because we aren't told how much oil the bridesmaids have at home. Maybe, just maybe, this is about the oil that you take with you, that you have on hand for any and all emergencies. That when it counts, you have enough oil to be useful to this beautiful community. You are useful now because the time is now. And you are part of the party. You are a critical element in these festivities. You are immersed in the greatest story ever told, which is why I raise my voice a little bit. This is exciting stuff. The good news in your life is so abundant that it leaks out to others and creates the beautiful community. Your oil reserves need not be empty. Your lamp is ready to be gloriously and generously filled, and only you can do it. And it doesn't help to leave that oil at home. So don't forget your flask. It's a concrete picture of the reality of a God that encourages and calls us to be ready and overflowing with abundant oil in the midst of community. Because if the kingdom of God that Jesus lived out while on earth is any indication of what we're supposed to be like as a people, that we are generous and abundant, and we care about one another and what we bring with us to the table, that when we go to meetings and worship, that we bring our best selves overflowing with the resources we need to help one another. Because sometimes the community is about the community helping you, but sometimes the community is about you helping someone else. So is your flask full? Full of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because in filling it, you light the way for others to be inspired, to fill up their flasks as well. So may your flasks be full. Amen.